Shabbat Shalom and greetings to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It's good to be back. I hope you had a blessed Passover. So many of you traveled here and we were blessed to meet new people, see old friends and gather together for the Moedim. We are, of course, counting the Oma on our way to Shavuot and then we'll be on our way to the full feast to fulfill more prophecy. Talking about that, we're in Isaiah in the 49th chapter today. And what prophecy is being fulfilled in this chapter? Let's delve right in. Remember, subscribe to the ministry channel. You can always catch us over on um, Odyssey. Thank you. We're backing it up over on Odyssey. And remember, subscribe and give us some thumbs up. Let's delve right into Isaiah, the fifth Hebrew gospel. Greet one another in the chat, make connections, and remember, visit us at TorahToTheTribes.com, and you can go to the Connect page. We've got a Shabbat fellowship and various other platforms there. Listen, O coastlands, Shema. Do you have an ear to hear? Listen, O coastlands, to me, and hear you nations from afar. Yahweh has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my Ema. Mother, has he made mention of my name? I mean, you'll only ever understand what's about to be revealed in this chapter, what's about to be revealed from the prophet Isaiah, if you can get out of the matrix. You've got to get out of the matrix. Everything that seems to be real is not real. You've got to wake up from that generational slumber. Get out of the matrix, out of the cultural programming. We need to be able to discern the true reality of how this world works, how it functions. We know, of course, that Yahusha is the word of Yahuwah. He is the one that gives us the sharp edge to be able to discern sharper than a two-edged sword. There are words everywhere, but the word of Yahuwah is able to cut and pierce asunder and give us that discernment to be able to be able to walk and understand the prophecies. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword, a sharp arrow. In the shadow of his hand has he hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my Eved. You are my servant, O Israel. This, of course, in the text is literally talking about Yahusha. It's not talking about Israel, the nation, as Judaism would like to deflect. No, this is talking about the prophecy of his servant, Yahusha, the servant branch. Of course, you are my Eved, O Israel, though whom, through whom I will be lifted up. Then I said, I've labored in vain. I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing. And in vain, yet surely in my mishpat, judgment is from Yahuwah and my work from my Elohim. So verse 4 really is a reflection of the servant Savior's prayer in the garden. Isn't it? Think about it. The disciples couldn't even stay awake, could they? They couldn't even stay awake. Trouble and chaos was pressing the servant, Yahusha, on all sides. This is Yahusha's perception of failure and insignificance. You and I are not alone. The best years of my life, oh my goodness, it didn't work out. I'm a failure, so insignificant in this world. 
His experience in the garden. This is what Isaiah is foretelling, prophesying. He is speaking and showing us through Yahushua's experience of rejection and apparent failure in the eyes of many. Remember? They were on the road to Emmaus, it was a, and it was abysmal failure. We thought, we thought it was him, but no, no, it was an absolute abysmal failure. Insignificant event, actually. It all appeared to be for nothing. Everything I did, all that work for nothing. That's what Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, will be telling us about. And that's exactly what John said in the first chapter. Yet we know that ultimately both Isaiah's servant and Yahushua, they had what? An unwavering faithfulness to Yahuwah's purposes. Do you have an unwavering faithfulness to Yahuwah's purposes in your life? You may feel insignificant. You may have a perception of yourself right now as a failure and insignificant in the big events of life. But Yahuwah has a plan and a purpose for you, for me, no matter how we feel about our current status. We have to have unwavering faithfulness to Yahweh's purposes because that will lead to what? Your exaltation and your vindication. You will be exalted. He will lift you up. You will be vindicated from the charges of this world, of the accusations and its wickedness. How do I know? Because it is written so. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, it is written, Therefore, Yahweh, he took him out of the garden. He took him out of his perception of failure and insignificance when his best friends couldn't even keep themselves awake. They betrayed him. He was alone, isolated, in despair, and he had a perception of failure and insignificance. Yahushua did. How much more me and you when you have a bad day? Therefore, Yahweh has highly exalted him, and he has given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Yahushua every knee shall bow of the heavenly ones and the earthly ones, because that's when we come out of the matrix. We see that this is a spiritual battle. Yes, we're in the earthly realm, but we have access to the heavenly realm to break through, and that every tongue should confess that Yahushua Hamashiach is Savior to the glory of of the Father in heaven. There's our exaltation and vindication. What about the perception of our own failures? And at times when we feel insignificant, we can take Isaiah's words and maybe even draw parallels to Yahushua's experience during his earthly life with our own lives to give us a hope to give us a future. Oh yes, you may have feelings of disappointment, feelings of um, disillusionment. Who hasn't been disillusioned? Maybe feelings of inadequacy, of being ineffective in your mission. No matter how hard you try, you just doesn't seem to be effective. Nothing seems to be working. But we are not alone because these are the very things that Yahushua experienced. These moments of apparent failure and rejection in our lives are the catalyst for great things to happen. Despite performing miracles, think about this, despite raising people from the dead, teaching profound truths, and loving people unconditionally, Yahushua still faced rejection from his own. He still had to deal with doubters, with critics, 
with haters and with cowards. Rejection. I mean, what happens in my life? What happens in your life when you're going through a feeling of being despised and rejected by mankind? Feeling like a man of suffering. Feeling like a man of sorrows. The daily grind becomes just familiar pain. Or sometimes it can be just what we need to launch us into our next season of victory and vindication. That's what I'm saying. Our lives can actually strike a parallel with Yahusha's life. Don't let the ridicule and opposition or scorn of this world distract you from accomplishing your goals and soaring to new heights and successes in life. Despite setbacks, despite apparent perceptions of failure in your life, you've got to stay steadfast in your commitment to Yahweh and his purposes in your life. Because he created you. Therefore, he does have a plan. Even though your perception is off right now. So Isaiah in the fifth verse, it really emphasizes the confidence that we should have in Yahuwah's purposes and mission for our life. That's what I'm saying. Look, but I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due to me is in Yahuwah's hand. It's due to you, not when you think it is. And not of the hands of because you've been diligent. Because whatever is due to you is in Yahuwah's hands. And your reward isn't going to be from men. It is from Elohim. And it is going to be in his timing. So all that to say this. Entrust Yahuwah and entrust yourself to Yahuwah. Entrust yourself to the will of the Father. Obediently fulfilling his mission, even unto death, of your ideas of what's fair and what's right and should be coming to you. Because you don't know. Maybe the thing that you think is dreadful that's upon you was the thing that was coming to you to get you into a whole new season of prosperity and blessing. I know that's what's happened in my life. Our ultimate vindication and exaltation comes to us in acceptance and peace. It was funny. I was walking the other day downtown and there was a, a Christian group and they had, a, you know, sometimes you see this, you know, trying to evangelize on the streets and they had um, a picture of a desert island with a bottle and they asked they I don't usually have make time for that but I was feeling in a jolly mood the sun was out and I thought oh, I'll have a I'll have a bit of a kick and a giggle here and I stopped he said can we ask a question ask you a question and I thought okay I know what's going on here there's a message bottle but I'm gonna flip the script here because they were trying to do outreach. And he's like, well, what would you do if you were on a desert island and you had to put a message in a bottle and send it off? I was like, if I was on a desert island, I would accept it and come to peace with it. And he's like, and it didn't work with his script. And he just sat, he just looked at me like, oh. I was like, you have a good day. <laughs> I just walked <laughs> off. Because you don't need these tools that men provide when you can come to peace and acceptance, knowing that Yahuwah has a plan for your life. We don't need to be concerned about the things that men think will rescue you. Because wherever you are, 
if you come to acceptance and peace, then you are already rescued. I've already been rescued. It doesn't matter where I am, whether I'm around a thousand people in a city, on an island, by I am rescued because I'm in peace and I've accepted. It's the key to life. It's time to get over our initial perceptions of failure and insignificance in our lives. Our situation, brethren, is ultimately going to be used for glory and honor and ultimately used to glorify and honor Yahweh if, if we just remain steadfast and see it through. I mean, I'm inspired by Isaiah's story of unwavering faithfulness to Yahweh's redemptive plan. I really am. Verse 5, And now Yahweh, and now says Yahweh, that formed me from the womb to be his Eved, his servant. So Yahusha was not created, but reformed as the word, the Memra, sent to Yaakov, Jacob. So Yahusha is the willing, suffering servant Messiah, the son of Yosef, Ben Yosef, the son of Yosef, from within Yahweh, all the way back at the mountain, eternity past, who was ordained to suffer, to do what? To bring the ten tribes home and reunite them with believing Judah. All twelve tribes is the flock of Jacob. To bring Yaakov again to him, Jacob, though Israel's not yet gathered, yet I am esteemed with Tithereth glory in the eyes of Yahuwah, and my Elohim shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light and easy and small thing that you should be my Eved, servant, to raise up the tribes of Yaakov, Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. And you can miss this phrase in the English translation, the preserved ones of Israel. To restore Yaakov. The Hebrew word here, to restore, is like Teshuvah, it's not Teshuvah, but it's the same as in Lashuv. You can hear the Shuv, to return, which is where Teshuvah, repentance, comes from. To return back to Yahweh. And without the servant, Israel cannot return. So what that is over in the Middle East is not Israel come out of the matrix. If they deny the servant, can they, have, can they have returned? It is impossible according to the prophecy. Things do not seem to be as they appear. That cannot be Israel because they reject the servant and Israel cannot return from the nations without the servant. It's very simple. If you're have come out of the matrix. Yahuwah gave Yahusha his mission. It is apparent in the garden, and there he gave Yahusha to give, he gave him the strength to perform that mission to gather Israel. The regathering then of the 12 tribes of both divided houses back into one united Israel. Remember, Jeroboam was appointed as a military commander by Solomon. It, it went to his head. And he was out walking, feeling pretty snazzy in a new garment one day. And a prophet of Yahuwah came up to Jeroboam, and he took the garment off of Jeroboam, and he shredded it into how many pieces? Twelve pieces. And he said, I'm going to give ten pieces to you. And you're going to take ten tribes of Israel. But I'm going to keep the house of Judah for my servant David. And Jeroboam panicked and he fled off to Egypt. And Solomon died. And then he thought he'd come back and give it a go with Solomon's son Rehoboam. 
And Rehoboam said, you know what? My father had a thick waist, but my little finger, they're like Prince Charles sausage fingers. And I am going to take the yoke that my father had. I'm going to add to that yoke. And the burden that was as thick as his waist is like my Prince Charles sausage finger. My little finger is going to be so fat that I'm going to add to that burden a thickness to you. And that was what Rehoboam said. And guess what Jeroboam did? He moved up to the north of Israel and he built two golden calves because he was like, they'll go back back to Judah to worship. I've got to create a new system for them, a matrix society for them. This is the world in which we live, brethren. It's not real. Come out of Jeroboam's system, Mystery Babylon, the nations. Come back. Be regathered as the whole house of Israel, all 12 tribes. All 12 tribes. Because this is the restoration of Jacob. The regathering of the 12 tribes, those divided houses, the 10 northern tribes and the tribe of Judah, which consisted of Benjamin and Judah and Levi, because that was the vicinity. The Benjamites was where the temple was. Then you had the Levites serving in there too, and the house of Judah, right? Which is David, the line of David. So you've got, of course, the 12 tribes to become united as one. That is not what is over there in the Middle East causing all this chaos in this world. What is impossible with the Zionist state of Israel, a construction of the matrix, communists, Bolshevist bankers, is possible and easy with Yahuwah. They can never do what Yahuwah is about to do on this earth because it's a matrix construction. It's not real. You know how many Messianics and Christians believe that's real? And the world? They really do. John Hopkins University did a DNA study. And they found that those within the Zionist state, their DNA was not Shemitic. Yet they did a DNA study of those in Gaza, the Palestinians, and they found that they had the Shemitic DNA. You see, but they're not going to tell you this. That was from John Hopkins University. I've been telling you this for years. But here we have this term in the Bible called ve Natsari, and it's spelled Vav Nun Samak Yod Resh Yod. The preserved ones is the Hebrew word ve Natsari, Netzarim, Nazarenes. The preserved ones will be Nazarenes, Notsari, the Notsari Israel, the name for the returning remnant of Israel, all 12 tribes. You see, what the church has failed to comprehend, and this is so massive, is the job of the Messiah was always to restore and return all 12 tribes back into one undivided Israel, the preserved ones, the ve notsuri of Israel, into one olive tree of Romans 11. I mean, they bang on about Romans 11 all the time without comprehending what happened with Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the migration of the tribes. Then, misguided people believing that a bunch of communist atheists in the state of Israel is actually biblical Israel when they hate the Messiah. What Bible are these people reading, I wonder? And they're all going to be happy clappy in in a few months when the red heifer comes out, believing that this is prophecy being fulfilled. When it's not at all. And they, they really will be doing it. They'll be like, oh my goodness, prophecy's good. The Messiah. Yeah, the Messiah's coming. The bloody anti Messiah, you tool sheds. What is up is down. What is black is white. 
They're still in the matrix. They've got to come out of the matrix to really comprehend what the prophet is saying here. The preserved believers from both houses or all tribes, all 12 tribes. The Hebrew word is Nazare Israel or the Nazarenes of Israel. How does traditional Judaism get around such language in the text? Well, in their Bibles, they leave out the vowel pointing to make the word appear as a different word. They're excellent at doing this. They've done it 134 times in the Masoretic text. And then they added a different but similar word with vowel pointing in brackets, changing the yud to a vav to purposely make the reader unable to pronounce the word notsuri as it actually appears and changing it to the Hebrew word netsuri or ruins, which is where we get the Judaic term from the communist, the lost tribes of Israel, as in the ruined tribes of Israel. Well, if you just read your New Testament, you know that that's absolutely false because the first verse of James tells us that they are not ruined tribes of Israel. To the 12 tribes of Israel scattered. And people don't realize where these lies come from. Satanic, communist Bolsheviks. Ashkenazi sons of Goma pretending to be the true Yehudites. But the church is in the matrix, just as the world is in the matrix. That's what I'm saying. That's what the word is clearly saying through the prophet Isaiah. These are not Netsuri ruined tribes. They're not the lost ten tribes. This is the Netsari, the Nazarene Israel coming back through the servant Messiah. The lost ten tribes or ruined ten tribes is an invention of matrix Judaism to replace the true Jews and biblical Israel with a Zionist state. James chapter 1 is very clear that the tribes are not lost, have not been lost, that they are not ruined, that they are simply dispersed ready to be regathered. Scripture doesn't teach that the ten northern tribes were ruined or annihilated or lost. It teaches that the remnant preservation did take place, not as a nation or a kingdom, but as individuals, you guys, the preserved ones of Jacob. That's the mission. That's the plan and the value in your life. The early believers in Jerusalem, Judea, Judah, Shimron, Samaria, which of course was Ephraim's former capital with the two golden calves up there, they were called Notzrim or Notzare or Anetzarim. Israel, which is why Yahushua's half-brother Yaakov, James, penned the introduction to his letter that way. History. The preserved ones have always been from both houses of Israel, from both the 721 before the common era and the 586 before the common era exiles. There were two exiles where they got dispersed. So we are the branches. And who is the vine? He tells us all of this, and we just read, the church just reads through it. It's like, oh, that's a cute allegory. Vines and branches, pass the communion cup. No, these words mean things. We are the preserved branches, the notzerim of the main vine, Yahushua HaMashiach. It's the very same word, netzarim, branches, as preserved ones. So you can see how Romans 11 is really so deep level mystery, but it's just glossed over by the church. And I'm not meaning to to, um, 
downtrod the church because I don't despise my humble beginnings. But it's time to come out of the slumber and the matrix. But many that I talk to, I would say, Mo, they don't want to. They don't really care to. Well, because it's only a remnant that is chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, though, but few are chosen. So we truly are the chosen, preserved branches. Isn't that amazing? John chapter 15, Yahusha, in the parable of the true vine, the Greek word there is ampelos, ampelos, which calls all believers, regardless of race, Nazarene, or branches, Netzarim, or ampelos. Jeremiah chapter 31, the sixth verse, you're watchmen, you're supposed to be watchmen on the wall, O house of Ephraim, or Another word for that is not sirim, not sirim, returning to the hills of Ephraim. Jeremiah in the 31st chapter, again, it's the first verse. Yahweh will be Elohim to all tribes of Israel again, the family of Israel. Acts chapter 15, what's the job of Messiah? To raise up the fallen tabernacle of David which was all 12 tribes, because it didn't get split until Jeroboam got his garment ripped into 12. If you don't understand what Jeroboam's garment being ripped into 12 pieces meant, then you don't understand three-fifths of the Bible. Do you realize that? You don't understand three-fifths of the Bible if you don't understand what that means. I was never taught it in the church. They're not going to teach it to you. And they're certainly not going to teach it from that Zionist regime. The fallen tabernacle of David. David, The raising up of the ecclesia, the kahal, the called out assembly. How? Through Yahweh's Torah, through his feasts and festivals. This is really the crux of the issue here as to who is and who isn't the Messiah. This is the crux of the issue. Who is and who isn't the Messiah. If a Messiah has successfully, listen, if a Messiah has successfully raised up a church void of biblical Israel, Void of all 12 tribes, void of Torah, void of Sabbaths, void of the feasts. He must be the Messiah, the anti-Messiah. It's that simple, brethren, and that's, that's a hard pill for people to swallow. The true Messiah must arrive and gather all the exiles of Israel, both houses and all their non-Israelite companions. Ezekiel 37 verse 15 through 17. If he has to deliver us and rescue us from the nations because we're Joseph's house and any of our non-Israelite companions, the stranger they can graft in too, just like in the Exodus. Look at the next verse. Six. I will give also for you a light to the heathen, that you may be my Yahusha, my Yeshua, my salvation to the ends of the earth. For this says Yahuwah, the Redeemer of Israel, their Kadosh One, their Holy One, to him who man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the Eved, servant over the rulers. Melachim shall see and arise, rulers also shall worship, because of Yahuwah that is faithful, and the Kadosh One of Israel, and he shall choose you. You are a chosen one. You are significant. This says Yahweh, in an acceptable time have I heard you, and in the the day of Yahusha have I helped you, and I will preserve you, O Notsuri, 
preserved ones, and I will give you for a Brit a covenant of the people to restore the land, to cause you to inherit the desolate heights, the mountains of Ephraim. Ezekiel again. Does this sound familiar to you? It should, because it's coming right to us in Second Corinthians chapter 6. Paul quotes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. But we read that totally out of, you know, Easter eggs and bunnies, right? Past the sun disc wafer and the cup of ritual blood. It's, it's so tragic, isn't it? It's so tragic what has become of us when we were in the matrix. But you know what? You can just kind of get by in the matrix. And most don't want to leave it. Mother Church, taking care of you, everything's pre-planned. It's cozy. And you know what? Everybody else is doing it. I'm not going to stand out. I am not going to expose my family to a standing up. I'm just going to carry on and just, just go, go, get along Go along to get along, or whatever the blooming word is, right? But you, I've seen it in 20 years. Most don't care. Most don't care. Only the not serene, the remnant branches care, the preserved ones. This is quoted, verse 8. By Shaul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, that these promises to physical Israel applied to the congregation at Corinth. Why? Because they were scattered Ephraimites and scattered Jehud Yehudites in the nations. This is way more evidence packed into the New Testament that these were actually Ephraimites that were in the Greek exile because the, Jew, the Jews went, of course, to this went down south, of course, and I've explained this in the migration of Judah to Negro land and the kingdom of Judah. And that in itself, you know, is really too much for most people to comprehend because they're still in the matrix and they don't want to read the history prior to the you know, 1700s because we want to keep you in the matrix. It's no different than the Australians, and we'll get to that in a minute. All the Jews of the kingdom of Judah, Negro land in West Africa. We are all just the dispersed yet redeemed remnant, the covenant people who the world hates and attempts to paper over with the church and the synagogue of Satan and the Zionist state or African Americans or mystery Babylon, whatever mechanism that they can put to label Mabel you to hide the true truth of who you are. Israel. Israel. You may as well call me a Viking to try and keep me from being who I truly am. Okay, I'm not a blooming Viking. Any more than you're an African American. But if we keep those labels, we'll never understand and come back to who we truly are. The house of Ephraim and the house of Judah. Scattered into the nations. But they'll label Mabel us, right? So that we stay in the matrix. And then they'll give us 300 years of history and then keep it at that. But the Bible tells us the truth. And you're not going to get it from the sons of Goma, Ashkenazi. Ashkenaz, a son of Goma, a Japhethite, not a Shemite. John Hopkins University. DNA studies will tell you that. And anyone who's read a little bit of history will come to the same conclusion. And then go and study a, a map of Africa in the 1600s and you'll find it quite, quite simple what really is going on here. Just as you will with the name Britain, Britam. What does that mean? Britam, Brit, covenant, am, people. Covenant people. Anglo-Saxons, what? Sons of Isaac, Ephraim. 
Does that mean everybody in England is Ephraimites? No, or certainly not now. There's a bunch of Saudis. Okay, I mean, it's insane. Because what they did to us is now going to happen to them. They scattered us into the nations. Guess what? Israel is going to be redeemed from the nations. And then guess what? There's going to be mass invasion. And they'll call it immigration. And the nations will get back on them what they did to biblical Israel. And that's what you're seeing happening all over the world. Not all over the world. In the Western European nations and here in the United States. You are seeing judgment coming on those that enslaved biblical Israel. It's come up and it's come up and we are the dispersed yet redeemed remnant, the covenant people who the world hates, but we are the remnant. Verse 9, that you may say to the prisoners, go out to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed on the ways and their pastures shall be in all the bare hills. The restoration is to set the captives of both houses free from bondage and doctrinal slumber in the matrix, but also to guarantee our physical return. Are we switching? We are? Okay, just making sure because I'm not sure which camera I'm supposed to be looking at. We were all just a bunch of former pagan prisoners, weren't we? That have been shown the error of our ways. And now it's time to clothe ourselves in the word of Yahuwah, grow up, come out of the matrix, and return under the shadow of his wings. Look at verse 10. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he has rachamin, mercy on them, and he shall also lead them. Even by the springs of Mayim, water, shall he guide them. Verse 11, and I will make all my mountains a derrick, a way, a path, and my highways shall be exalted. See, these shall come from afar, and see, and from the north, and from the west, and from the land of Sinim. Remember I said it's happening down in Australia too? Because what is the land of Sinim? Well, the land of Sinim, according to Rashi, and the Aramaic translation of this verse is the land of Sinim, is the land of the south, the great south land. The land furthest away from Israel is, of course, Australia. Now, in the Latin Vulgate translation of Jerome, the word for this verse is Sinim. What does that sound like? Sounds like Sinai, doesn't it? Or is Australi, Australi in the English, Australia. You see, Rashi writes that it's the lost tribe of Simeon that ended up in Australia, the great Southland. Well, Simeon, didn't Simeon have um, some problems? Yes? Now, I'm not saying that Simeons always were prisoners or anything, and shipped to the great south line by the British monarchy with the sausage fingers. But, you know, I kind of am, aren't I? Now all the Australians are going to hate me. Well, get in line. But no, seriously. Rashi does write that the lost tribe of Simeon ended up in Australia, the great Southland. It's interesting to know, of course, Sinim gets its root from Sinai, as in the people that came to the mountain to receive the Book of the Covenant, the Malchizedek priesthood, the blessings that are for Israel. Even some of them got dispersed and ended up in the great south land, Australia. So is that the Aborigines? Mm. We don't want to talk about that, though, do we? Well, that's another subject for another day. Verse 13, sing, O Shamayim, heavens, and be full of simcha, joy, O earth, and break forth into singing. O mountains for Yahweh has comforted his, Yahweh has comforted his people. 
and will have rachamin mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion says, Yahweh has forsaken me, and my master has forgotten me. Well, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should not have rachamin mercy on the son of her womb? Yes, perhaps they may forget. Yet will I not forget you. See, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. This was before, this was written before the exile. Both exiles. This verse is written before both exiles occurred. I mean, yet Isaiah is prophesying that the regathering is a work of crucifixion. The death penalty position is paid for the whole house to come back together. A family. Are you Abraham's seed? In him is the promises and the covenants. and It's all written there. I mean, Paul spoke of it to the Ephesians. Those nail-pierced hands is for his love for his family. Israel. All 12 tribes. Not Japhethites. Not Ashkenans, Gomorites. And not a bunch of Romans either. Shuv, repent and return. Verse 17, your children shall shuv, shall hurry back to me, your destroyers, and they that made you a ruin shall depart from you. Lift up your eyes all around and see all these who have gathered themselves together and have come to you. As I live, says Yahweh, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as with an ornament and bind them on you as does a bride. The garment that was torn from Jeroboam is being restored as the bride's whole garment. For your waste and your desolate places and the land of your destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of its inhabitants. It is a narrow, sharp edge knife walk that we are on. And in the matrix, it is nice and broad. Very broad. Very, very, very broad. Look at verse 20. The children which you shall have after you have lost the others shall say again in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. This is way too narrow. You mean we don't get to do all this Christian stuff anymore? That's, 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 well, I can't have shrimp anymore? Well, you can. And people will be like, what? so you're saying that I'm not going to go to heaven if I, if I eat shrimp? No, you will. It's a lot faster. And then when, if you get there, you might find that you're least in the kingdom because you couldn't even follow simple instructions. We've all done it, so I'm not pointing fingers. You know, a rubber tire tastes good if you put enough butter and garlic on it. And if you don't believe me, go to Subway and have a sandwich because their bread's made out of rubber blooming tires. It really is. It's made out of gym mats. Yeah. Put an ingredient in there. It's a, it's, it makes the bread fluffy. That's what gives it that nice fluffiness. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Verse 21. Then shall you say in your lev, your heart, who has begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children and am barren, and am an exile wandering back and forth? Who has brought these up for Aliyah? See, I was left alone, and now all these, where have they been? You see, we are currently, brethren, prophecy being revealed in your very days. If you have come out of the matrix, you will begin to see it. We are currently seeing in the nations with these mass invasions from foreign nationals over our borders, Western Europe's borders, Australia's borders, 
the borders in the United States. This is prophecy coming true. Here, the nations that oppressed Ephraim and Judah are having the tables turned on them. As they were tormenting and oppressing us, they now will be tormented and, impre and oppressed by invaders. There is going to be a global exodus to the Western nations. Do you see? They imprisoned the, houses, the house of Israel and would not let our people go. And now we are going to be let go by the outstretched arm of Yahuwah. And in our place, there is going to be a mass invasion of heathen into the very nations that caused our slavery. That is why Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States are suffering this. And it is only just beginning. So, while Ephraim and Judah are being gathered, the heathen nations, once our oppressors, are being broken up through immigrant invasion. We who were swallowed up in the nations get to depart those nations as those nations get swallowed up themselves. Quite sobering. This is exactly what happened to the Assyrians. This is exactly what happened to the Babylonians. This is exactly what happened to the Medo-Persians. And if you ever wondered what happened to the Roman Empire, this is exactly what happened to them too. And then they put soy boys in the army. And the way you go. Look who are, look who, I mean, I mean, now we've got girl boys, boy girls, I don't know what it is, in, in dressed, I mean, they're telling, the, it's in it, this, And where does it come from? Ishtar, Easter, the fertility bare-breasted goddess that the whole Christian church has been lauding for 2,000 years has finally manifest herself in transgenderism, cutting off the breasts and doing all kinds of things. This is from Ishtate, and you've just closed your eyes to it, and you've been bringing it up in worship, and now it's come back to roost with its eggs. And you're wondering how, why? You let it grow and grow and grow, and now you've got no power to stop it. And this prophecy is now coming to pass. We are being gathered, and the nations are being invaded. This says the master Yahweh. See, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Verse 23, And Melachim shall be your nursing avot, and their queens your nursing mothers, and they shall bow down to you with their faces towards the earth and lick up the dust of your feet, and you shall know then when and then, when they're trying to breastfeed their children from somebody that's a biological male, then when? Then you'll really know you're in hell. For they shall not be ashamed to wait for me. Shall the prey be taken for the mighty or the victors' exiles delivered? But this, says Yahweh, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the ruthless shall be delivered. For I will contend with them that contend with you, and I will save your children, and I will feed them that oppress you with their own flesh. Look at this. And they shall be drunk with their own blood. 
as with sweet wine, and all the flesh shall know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. There is going to be the regathering of the whole house of Israel from the nations, those that have enslaved us, and then the nations get invaded by heathens. And in the meantime, Ashtate causes mass confusion and a misgendering in the army and everything, just as it happened with the Romans, the Medo-Persians, as it happened before, it is happening again. And when you start to put that in your armed forces, then that is the beginning of the end. Read your Roman history. They imported foreigners into the army and they didn't have the stomach or the will to fight. And then they became so decadent and then there was all that ishtate, bare-breasted fertility worship, cutting off members and everything that you see today. Where does this come from? There is nothing new under the sun. But in the matrix, you're programmed that this is some amazing new technology. You can look at hieroglyphics and see that this stuff was going on before. You want to talk about perverts? Talk about the Corinthians and the Romans and the Medo-Persians and the Babylonians. Read your history. That's all I got for you. <laughs> but it's enough because it's prophecy being fulfilled in our day. But you'll never understand what is being revealed if you can't get out of the matrix of your mother, meaning that generational programming. Because that was the way I was, then I should continue in this thinking. No. Well, if it was good enough for Billy Graham, it was good enough for me. Welcome to your slumber, my friend. If it was good enough for Chuck Smith, then it's good enough for me. Welcome to your slumber, my friend, in the Matrix. Oh, 1948, the creation of the State of Israel. Oh, the coming of Messiah. Oh, the red heifer sacrifice. This is exciting times. Oh, but only if you knew. Come out of the Matrix, my friend. These are amazing times in which we live, but we have to have the right perception. Don't perceive your life as a failure. Don't perceive yourself as insignificant. You are highly significant, and your life is a triumph to Yahweh's glory if you understand the regathering of the whole house of Israel and who you are. Praise Yahweh. I'll catch you live, Yahweh willing, next week for chapter 50. We're getting into the 50s. Subscribe. Please consider donating to the ministry. Please consider putting some comments down that are edifying and encouraging and apocalyptic and expose this matrix in which people are still living. And remember, the hope and glory of Israel is upon us. We're seeing it in our lives today. Shabbat Shalom.